Hello, it's great to be here today and to have a chance to talk to you about my latest book and some of the ideas that it throws up that hopefully you'll find interesting. Firstly, a little bit about me. So I'm really interested in how some of the often quite odd ideas which we have about our human evolutionary past influence us today and how challenging these ideas with new interpretations might help us out of some of the pretty awful mess we find ourselves in. My particular area is how we use material evidence to better understand how human emotions evolve, something which is often overlooked and yet I'd like to convince you that the study of how our emotions evolved and what that evidence can tell us has a lot to contribute to today. So let's start by thinking about what's so wrong about our current understanding of how we evolved. So if I ask you to think of an image which summarizes human evolution, you'll probably think of something like this. It's a really good place to start to explain how odd our ideas about our origins really are. And it's this typical idea of a stooped ancestor rising up from this kind of brutish kind of past to become, you know, stand tall, be confident and walk into this positive future. Firstly, I think the most obvious thing that, that's wrong with some of this is it is quite a male view, isn't it? Even though we know that there were not only women there in the past, but we know that women were pretty darn essential and certainly not the pathetic creatures which are often portrayed. But we know that reconstructions of our past, which sort of reflect our assumptions, always seem to show women sitting down and never holding anything particularly sharp. Something you can see in a couple of these reconstructions here, the women are typically sitting down, not holding anything sharp, retreating a little bit to the back, just, you know, looking after the children. The men often aren't doing that. All sorts of assumptions come into this. And what I think is really rather wonderful about that is some of these assumptions we're imposing on our past actually match some of the ones we also put on our future none of which make any kind of sense when we kind of drill down. So the women in our evolutionary reconstructions are often very like the lovely Lieutenant Ahura on the first season of Star Trek, only allowed to kind of do the communication, not really very often allowed down on the planets and, uh, you know, not allowed to hold anything sharp or dangerous. Fantastic that she was there in the first place, really. So it's fascinating to see how what we project on the future is what we imagine humanity to be. That's also what we project on the past. And really, pretty obviously, we should put women like on an equal footing and in many places at the forefront in all of these um, visions. But of course, that's that's perhaps the most obvious thing that's wrong with our ideas. But more than this, we often seem to project ourselves today as the pinnacle of a progressive force that gets to us as this like ultimate creation at the end. And we're beginning to, I think, reflect firstly that we are anything but perfect. And this is not how evolution works anyway. It's always just a process about adapting to the situations at the time. And it's always been messy and complicated. If we look at this evolutionary tree, it doesn't even itself encompass all the messiness we know was there. You can see that there's lots of different human ancestors, lots of different branches, which actually we now know interconnect in this very complex pattern. And much of what happened is really rather random with no defined endpoint. And we're certainly not a pinnacle of perfection. This matters, of course, because if we think we are, we can just relax. After all, things will get better. We'll progress to a better place, but we're really not. So that means we can't just assume things will turn out fine because something makes us special. Nothing makes us special. Could have been Neanderthals who are here today instead of us. And I'm not entirely sure that things might not have been better if it had been. 
But there are other areas of this image that tell us more about ourselves than anything to do with the past and are quite important to unpick. And one is that this image of a evolutionary past of this progressive person moving to be better is also very much about one person. We imagine our evolution was about ourselves, a single individual in the past. We ask the question, how did I become me from our evolutionary past? But of course, evolution has never been about a single person. It's been about how people work together. This is a reconstruction from Cima de los Huesos, a site about uh, half a million years old in northern Spain. And we want to think, don't we, about how people work together, because really just look at ourselves. We would not survive out there with all those predators as a single individual. We are just not. Where are the fangs? Where are the claws? We are not made for survival alone. And we should perhaps face that. Um, Early humans were surrounded by predators. They needed to face dangerous game to find food. We can't do that alone. And the image reminds us it was all about groups. But it also brings to mind the last issue I want to cover. And that's how we think of our ancestors always being big and strong and emotionally and physically invulnerable. Whereas I would argue that it's that physical and emotional vulnerability which was actually the really special point about our evolutionary past that made us distinctive, that bound us together and made us collaborative in new ways. We don't like the idea of vulnerability and we should begin to engage with it. Why is this an interesting reconstruction? Well, it shows everyone as a perfect person. And that's interesting because finds at this site were included several individuals who we would think of as having serious disabilities, being looked after by the others, a child with craniosynthesis, someone who's probably deaf, an elderly man who would have struggled to walk with a serious hip condition. They don't make it to the reconstructions. We edit them from our past and yet their presence is not just about equality today and perhaps it's that, but also about our understanding of the extent to which we're repressing vulnerability and uh, instead of accepting the basic vulnerabilities that come along with being human. So we were far from invulnerable and there's abundant archaeological evidence for the physical side of our vulnerability and the dependence that that brought with others. For example, we can start at 1.6 million years ago. This is an example of a Homo ergaster female from East Africa who died a long, slow death over many months from hypervitaminosis A, from which we can see the evidence in her bones. She must have been looked after, fed and brought water and defended from predators for many weeks. This is far more than the care that we see in chimpanzees. At this point, this far back in our past, we're already seeing something a little bit unique happening. If we move to half a million years ago, this is the individual I mentioned, a child with craniosynthesis. Uh, and again, several differences in this site would have been supported. 60,000 years ago, our favorite relatives, the Neanderthals, this is the man from Shanadar Cave in Iraq, had a, a withered arm and a withered leg. Um, and you can see here, like that sort of cut off part here, blind in one eye, uh, probably deaf, was looked after for at least 15 years since those injuries happened. And in fact, care for injury, injuries widespread in Neanderthals with few reaching adulthood without breaking a major bone, but actually quite low rates of infection and remarkable recovery. The willingness and capacity to look after each other was, seems to have been fundamental to how these people managed to survive. My favorite example, I should probably not be really able to tell you because it's out of my area, it's a little bit too recent, three and a half thousand year old site of man back. This is burial nine. This is a paraplegic man 
who was cared for for about a decade. And here we're looking at an investment in someone else's care, which would have been demanding today, would have needed special food, would have needed to be interned daily. There are many of these examples, and they all tell us a story of interdependence and vulnerability, which we often find uncomfortable. Why do we find it uncomfortable and how might it contribute to our understanding of ourselves today? Well, this awareness of what we're missing and how important it might be is the context from which I wrote this volume. We don't like to talk about emotions and we really don't want to think about human vulnerability, but we really must. Because I've become convinced that our evolutionary past, in our evolutionary past, it's our emotions which have taken us on our path to evolutionary success rather than intelligence and its intelligence that's followed. And moreover, with our particular emotional capacities come emotional vulnerabilities that drive human connections and which define who we are. So what I want to do today then, I want to look at the evidence for that argument and hopefully convince you. I'm going to look at two key transitions. Firstly, I'm going to look at the emergence of our genus, the genus Homo, termed and, and what I've termed the origin of human compassion. And secondly, I want to look at the emergence of our species and what I've termed the origin of human tolerance. Both occurred during unusually harsh and variable climates. The first, around two million years ago, involved the emergence of a movement into a new niche, which involved interdependence, actively hunting animals, as well as more elaborate and even more aesthetic stone tools. And the second involves the emergence of extended social networks crossing large regions and offering resource short shortfalls and famines, as well as prompting new innovations and ways of doing things. I want to discuss the emotional basis behind these changes and to persuade you that it only makes sense if we take on board that human success has depended on shared strength based on individual emotional vulnerability. So let's get into this evidence. Well, after about two million years ago, this is when we start to see lots of changes in our archaeological record. We start to see new forms of hominins, more meat eating and hunting, dependent young and new types of tools, as well as larger brains. And we see that early humans have moved into a new ecological niche in which they also expand out of Africa. They break free of our physiological limits for the first time. Now, our intelligence focus approach has always seen these changes, this important transition as being about increasing intellect, the rise of human intelligence and its capacity to dominate nature. But there's very good evidence that we're wrong. I argue that there's hidden depths to what's going on that we need to pay attention to. Because if we look deeper, we see that the evidence is actually driven by emotional changes. For example, if we look at crania, the skulls that have been found, we found that the lateral part of the orbitofrontal cortex, this part of the brain, expands and starts to expand before many of these changes take place. So as early as Australopithecus sediba, dating to two million years ago, which has a brain size similar to a chimpanzee, we're seeing important changes associated with social and emotional processing and empathizing, as well as social tolerance and emotional inhibition. We also see other physical changes, such as evidence for reduced canines. We also see care for the vulnerable, and there are a couple of possible cases coming in prior to 2 million years ago, as well as the case that I mentioned at 1.6 million. And we'll come on to why this might be happening later. <laughs> 
At sites such as Olduvai FLK Zinj, we see hunting and with it sharing of food, large species that will have demanded taking risks for others and sharing afterwards at about 1.8 million years ago. And it's this hunting, taking risks and sharing, which are both really fundamentally emotional things. They're not just about intellects. We have to put our lives on the line. and We have to put other people before us to share. And at this site at FLK Zinge, we see cut marks on over 250 bones of species such as antelope, which shows that people had quite early access to carcasses. These, um, they also see increasingly dependent young who take longer to grow up, which suggests that we're looking at sharing of infant care. And we see displays of emotional inhibition that, that appears to be developing within uh, the brain as well in the way in which stone tools are made. Stone tools such as hand axes show an aesthetic appreciation of form which will influence others we assume which demands emotional inhibition which may have demonstrated to others the capacity to be trusted. So there's a really good reason to think that some really key things are happening to human emotions and that this happened before other changes such as intellect. But what were these changes and why? Well, we can get some insights if we look at comparisons with other apes, because actually I think we're quite different. There are many similarities. Some of our differences are quite telling and they also reflect similarities with some other types of animals. So if we look at how we compare to other apes, we'll see that other apes such as chimpanzees, our closest relatives, have quite limited care or provisioning of ill and injured, perhaps things like wound cleaning. They lack shared infant care. Infant care is largely the responsibility of mothers, perhaps with other siblings. There's limited sharing of food. There's limited risk taking on behalf of others. There's a, n n most apes nest individually and touch by grooming. So these are social animals, but they're also quite, to our eyes, independent. In fact, what's happening to the behaviours we see in early humans from two million years ago is that they seem far more like what we see in some highly social mammals like wolves and other social carnivores. Wolves, for example, demonstrate food sharing, very explicit and careful sharing with everyone in the group, provisioning of the ill and injured. So where there is uh, particularly dangerous hunting, then wolves will provision the ill and injured and African wild dogs routinely provision ill and injured group members. We see collaborative parenting and we see risky group defence, that ability to put one's life on the line for someone else. And it's based on a common neurobiology of empathizing with others' offspring and other adults, extending a basic capacity for maternal care outwards into other group members. And that's something that we humans also share and do. Compared to other apes, we respond to the vulnerability of people in our groups. In fact, we often respond to vulnerabilities of people throughout the world that we sympathize with and respond to. And that's a quite remarkable thing, which doesn't necessarily make us different from any other animal, but shows some similarities with some of these deeply give and take bonded social carnivores. These are African wild dog puppies. So our story has been one of intellect and intelligence being what allowed us to rise to become successful and to tactically work together. But actually, that story seems to be rather one of emotional responses changing to give us the motivations to work together and develop relationships based on high degrees of give and take. And we're not surprised, in fact, we should not be surprised that that's happening because we're taking a small 
relatively defenseless hominin putting into a difficult situation where there's dangerous predators, there's dangerous hunting, vulnerable offspring. In that kind of situation where the loss of any group member impacts on individual success, but everyone's at risk when anybody is lost, we should see, we expect to see selection for an extension of helping to include all group members. So there are good evolutionary reasons why this should be taking place. So we may see then similarities in the way we respond to the way in which these social carnivores respond to other members of their group, which perhaps makes it not so surprising that we're very happy to share our lives with social carnivores. And in fact, I'll show you the very social carnivore I'm sharing my life with at the minute that's looking out the window. We're very happy to share our lives with social carnivores and rather l very much less happy to share our lives with other apes. But what's interesting, of course, is these emotional responses. And here in this image, I've contrasted strategic co collaboration on the left, which is what we expect if we just collaboration based on intellect alone, with emotionally based elaborate collaboration on the right. And that emotional investment leads to um, high degrees of give and take in situations where people trust each other to repay things over time um, should they need help in the future. It also explains why we would see pressures on intelligence and intellect coming later, because that question of who to trust is such an essential one, who to trust to develop these kind of relationships of give and take. So that willingness to give is itself a vulnerability and the willingness to respond to others is also a vulnerability. So humans become more emotionally vulnerable and interdependent to become more collaborative. And these very same vulnerabilities, which are also a strength, structure all our relationships today. And I don't think we live in a society that gives full credit to the significance of those emotional vulnerabilities to who we are and to the type of societies we should create in the future. Well, I'm going to look at the second phase of transition and I'm going to skirt over it a little bit more quickly because otherwise I'm taking rather too much of your time. But you'll find all the details in the book, which is downloadable for free. So no need to buy anything there. Um, if you want to have a look at that. I don't want to take too much of your time by going on too much. The same pattern, though, can be seen after 300,000 years ago, where change is assumed to be about brains, technology and intellect. Actually, when we look deeper at those hidden depths, actually seem to be far more about emotional transitions. So what's happening then? Well, starting at 300,000 years ago and particularly kind of taking a greater pace after 100,000 years ago, we see rapid migration into previously occupied areas, movements of raw materials and artifacts over huge distances, networks of giving and common styles across large areas, elaborate and in fact even excessive efforts into ornate things like art for example or tools I use an example of solution points will come on to and a new relationship new collect connections with objects and with animals of which a good example for, is the domestication of wolves which make a transformation in what our communities become so huge transformations are taking place in human society. And here's a illustration of a simplified view of some of that expansion out of a broad zone which covered, you know, Africa and a large part of and part of the rest of like Asia and Europe. Um, and then became expanded into Australia and the Americas after this transformation. We see 
really finely made tools. It's a solution. Foliate point probably took maybe three hours to produce at least. But more than that, it took thousands of hours of practice to get the level of skill that made it possible to make these kind of points. An elaborate upper Paleolithic art, that famous Ice Age art of Europe, which shows like, again, a huge investment in this kind of level of skill that might make making these things possible. And I think when we look at this through the lens of what's changing emotionally, it's very hard to explain the sheer effort put into some of these levels of art and skill without thinking about those famous things about a craving to be appreciated. For me, this is natural talent, but not just natural talent. This is not just an, a new capacity for art. For me, this is a new need to be appreciated. And for some reason, that mattered more than ever before. And we'll come on to that. So this is also the time in the past where we see wolves being domesticated. Once again, if we look deeper, and I've just hinted at that with that craving to be appreciated, we see evidence that much of this may be driven by emotional changes, not some new capacity, some new skill, some new intellect, some intelligence that made it possible to spread through the world to have new connections to, to wolves, not the imposition of intellect on the world around us, but a change in vulnerability. So let's look at those hidden depths, or at least cover some of them. Some of the most obvious are some of the changes we see in our anatomy and some of the genetic evidence we see for hormonal changes. So compared to earlier species, we see a reduction in the brow ridges in our species, uh, which may be to do with less requirements to express dominance and more requirements to have a maneuverable area above the eye, which allows us to make those complicated eyebrow movements where we express sympathy or empathy. Um, we also see other changes in the in the skull shape. And in fact, these changes are very similar to those we see as um, wolves transform into domesticated dogs as they become friendlier and more tolerant. So this friendly, more tolerant, this is this transformation in our anatomy, which is associated in other animals where we see similar changes in cranial shape and not just in wolves, also in rats and other species and foxes is associated with being more friendly and more tolerant and something that's been called human self-domestication. And we can argue about whether that's an appropriate term, but what we can see is anatomical changes which reflect those changes, but also genetic changes, um, which show changes in oxytocin and serotonin and vasopressin, which are all associated with this increased friendliness. Now, increased friendliness sounds like an eminently good thing. It makes it possible for uh, people to connect across large areas of landscapes by making new friends in new groups, to develop new types of relationships through being less scared of other people, less timid and more welcoming and more open to, to new things. However, I think we should remove as I said before, any idea of progress from this. In our previous transition, we talked about increasing vulnerability. This is also a time of increasing vulnerability because domesticated species are much more vulnerable to a lack of social support, more needy, if you like, more anxious isolation. And we only need to look at our own domestic dogs, mine of which couldn't go anywhere else but on the desk when I'm working, um, to see the downsides of domestication, that neediness to be near people, the difficulties with isolation, how crushing we find loneliness or poor relationships. Poor relationships are factors more significantly than smoking or obesity because we are dependent on developing trusting, giving and generous relationships with others. We know this scientifically. Do we accept it in our societies? I suspect maybe not. 
Could an understanding of its significance in our evolutionary past help us? I'd like to think so. So if we look again at the archaeological record, much of what we see can be explained through this understanding of an emotional neediness that starts to develop, along with that capacity to be friendly, to form new links, to have things that buffer changes in environment through social connections, through large amounts of give and take across whole new sets of people. But it's also a complex story. And here we're looking at um, uh, shell beads, or Ignatian shell beads, which spread right across Europe at the beginning of the Ice Age. And they're very similar across huge regions. People are wearing these similar necklaces. For me, this is about comfort. This is about connection. This is about feeling that craving to belong, which I suspect is quite new and as much a vulnerability as a strength. And if we also look, this is a rather fascinating site. This is the Bon Obercastle dog. Um, and this is an example of a 14,000 year old site which revealed the remains of a dog, a late juvenile buried with two adult humans. The dog had had canine distemper, and must have been ill for a considerable period with several bouts of disease showing in their enamel and is likely to have been looked after by humans. So here we have those humans whose need in us and difficulties with isolation presumably played some role in that drawing in of wolves and dogs into our lives, our need for that extra um, social support, that extra emotional connection that they bring so much that we're willing to look after them from this far back. And this is something that we see in ethnographic populations, or at least some ethnographic populations throughout the world, in which whilst in some cultures dogs are believed to be uh, spirits, evil spirits in some ways, and not everybody looks after dogs with a huge amount of connection, in many we see really significant bonds being formed. This I reflect. This, I think, reflects the significance of wolf domestication as an emotional, as being prompted through the emotional changes we see in humans at this time. Serpel, for example, mentions how Lumholtz, the Swedish explorer um, in Australia, mentioned that the uh, indigenous hunter-gatherers, he noted, treated their dogs, he says, with greater care than they bestow on their, old, their own children. The dingo is an important member of the family. It sleeps in the huts, gets plenty to eat, not only of meat, but also with fruit. Its master never strikes, but merely threatens it. He caresses it like a child, eats the fleas off it, and then kisses it on the snout. When hunting, sometimes it refuses to go any further. I know how that feels. And its owner then has to carry it on his shoulders, a luxury of which it is very fond. Not all peoples are that tolerant of the dogs which um, live within their communities. But it's fascinating to find that this is something we found, find throughout the world. So I argue then that what we've seen in the archaeological method record as achievements appearing particularly after 100,000 years ago can actually be seen as a reflection of some of the compensatory mechanisms, compensatory mechanisms coming in to make up for new emotional sensibilities and new vulnerabilities, new needs to belong that changes in social tolerance bring. So while social tolerance would bring the possibility for interconnected communities, resilient to resource shortfalls, a spread of cultural innovations, and a sort of social sensitivity, capacities for subtle emotional communications and for shared culture and shared understandings, it also brings pitfalls, a sensitivity to emotional distress and disorders through loneliness and lack of connection, a sensitivity to cultural context, poor emotional being, poor emotional well-being where contexts are not supportive. And I would argue many of us are suffering through that today because we just don't think it's important. And a vulnerability to others' opinions and an eagerness to please that we'd love to not have, but we all have it. 
Compensatory mechanisms include those emo new emotional connections such as to dogs and organized aggregations we start to see in the archaeological record, people coming together, they need to belong, ritualized rules of social engagement, means of maintaining harmony and a real focus on ensuring secure childhood experience to try and buffer children uh, from some of these vulnerabilities. Now, in the book, I talk about how some of these differences, um, which we see in our own species, may contrast with some areas of Neanderthal experience. Neanderthals are not necessarily putting this much effort into these compensatory attachments. They maybe didn't need them. They're not necessarily focusing on people meeting together over big areas. They didn't need to, which doesn't make them emotionally less complex but perhaps makes them emotionally different, more inward focused rather than outward focused. But that is something that I would suggest you look in the book for because there's not time in this talk. So once again, in this phase, and here are some of the examples, humans become more emotionally vulnerable and interdependent to become more collaborative, to extend collaboration beyond those tight knit groups with give and take into communities with give and take, we see the only way that that's achieved is through more vulnerability. In this case, a vulnerability to isolation, a vulnerability to loneliness, to lack of belonging and neediness for connection. Why does this matter today? Why does any of this new interpretation of our evolutionary past as one of a series of transitions in emotional vulnerability, which at each point make new collaborations possible and make humans more successful, um, but yet at the same time means that we carry with us all as individuals those vulnerabilities today. Why does it matter? Well, our unique human emotions, I believe, were first and most important in our evolutionary origins. So ignoring them today is something we do at our peril. They make us emotionally vulnerable as individuals, but stronger together. This matters because this is a very different message about who we are than the one we're used to. We're used to a message about intellect, you know, that that the most important thing about humans is our intelligence and that our intelligence will allow us to dominate the world, to progress and to build this bite of better future. I think in forgetting our emotions and our emotional vulnerability, we have lost track of who we are in a way that matters. It's no wonder we all feel an emotional mess in the world we live in today. We haven't set up societies or cultures to accommodate vulnerabilities. We don't think of accommodating people's potential loneliness or lack of belonging or any of the other things that we all feel into our plans for the future. We focus just on intelligence or economics. So we've chosen to ignore the real story of who we are in favor of a story and an ethic of individuality and invulnerability. And I think we've done that to our cost. And I think I'm only just grappling really with some of the deeper implications of this. Um, I think some things though seem to stand out. If we focus on what we can measure we lose sight of what's really important, that which lies underneath, which is how we feel. If we expect our children to be intellects first and vulnerable emotional beings second, because that's what we think is key to humanity, then they suffer and they are suffering. The rates of complex trauma are increasing. We see high rates of anxiety and depression. We're just not looking, we're just not recognizing what has always been important. And if we expect ourselves to be independent from nature and invulnerable, then we simply destroy our environments. So it's not just that our emotions are not suited to the modern world, which is something we often hear. There's a there's a you know an emotional setup for came from the Stone Age. It doesn't really suit us today. There's more than that. Our modern world is not suited to our emotions, and it needs to be.
So really, I have a question. If we take on board our emotional vulnerability as key to how societies work, could that make a difference? Would it make a difference? Could we imagine putting emotions first in what we value and vul emotional vulnerabilities? Could we imagine putting vulnerable emotions first in education? Could we imagine how we might put our vulnerability to nature first? So perhaps more questions than answers because I've given you a new story of human emotions and a new story of who we are, which I think is important and perhaps makes a difference. Because if we look at the hidden depths behind the obvious story, we may have a better understanding of who we are. But I think we're only just beginning to appreciate why that might be important or what that might mean. And that's something perhaps I only have a, a a mild insight into and you may have some better ideas. Thank you.